We ask for the guidance of thy Holy Spirit. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would anoint our eyes with eye salve, that we may comprehend the deep things of God. Help us, O Lord, to discern in your past leadings of thy people lessons for our time. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We are addressing uh, Acts of the Apostles, page uh, 68 and 69. But as you will see, I'm going to springboard from those two pages to the great controversy because uh, what is on especially page, well, especially page 68 has a lot to do with uh, great controversy. As you see there on your first question, study page 68 along with the great controversy, pages 197 to 219. The chapter entitled Protest of the Princes. This chapter is directly re related to Acts of the Apostles 68 and 69 as you will see. And if you have access to the book which Ellen White quotes in both books entitled History of the Reformation of the 16th Century by J. H. Merle Dobin. That, was, that would be a great blessing also. This book is on the E.G. White, CD, uh, e. White CD-ROM. Ellen White gives, reference, gives references to this book in Great Controversy in Acts of the Apostles. Some of the answers to the questions in this lesson may be found in that book. Uh, so, let's go ahead and read now the uh, page 68 of, of uh, Acts of the Apostles. And I'm going to drop down to the, uh, it would be actually the first full paragraph. The principle for which the disciples stood so fearlessly when, in answer to the command not to speak any more in the name of Jesus, they declared, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, is the same that the adherence of the gospel struggled to maintain in the days of the Reformation. When in 1529, the German princes assembled at the Diet of Spires, there was presented the emperor's decree restricting religious liberty and prohibiting all further dissemination of the Reformed doctrines. It seemed that the hope of the world was about to be crushed out. Would the princes accept the decree? Should the light of the gospel be shut out from the multitude still in darkness? Mighty issues for the world were at stake. Those who had accepted the Reformed faith met together, and their unanimous decision was, let us reject this decree. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. And as you see at the bottom of that paragraph, Merle, Merle Dobin is quoted in his book, History of the Reformation of, it doesn't have the entire uh, title, but my wife and I have a copy of this book, History of the, of the Reformation of the 16th Century. This book, Ellen White quotes often in great controversy, and as you can see, even in uh, Acts of the Apostles. Okay. And this is a very old book, of course, reprinted. My wife and I read this book um, for worship time some years ago. Took us uh, over a year of evening worships to read this entire book. It is, I, we loved it and wished that we had the time even now to, to read it again. Not just for the history, not only for the history's sake, but also just the manner in which the man wrote. Anyway, if you love to read, that's a good book, I'll tell you what. And anyway, not to uh, belabor that point. Uh, so let's now go to Great Controversy. Hopefully you brought your Great Controversy with you. 
because uh, what she said there in that paragraph in Acts of the Apostles is connected to the chapter in Great Controversy, page 197, starting the uh, protest of the princes. We're going to uh, bounce off from there, and I'm, I'm going to read portions of this book, The History of the Refor Reformation of the 16th Century. And uh, Brother Toby, would you read the first paragraph? One of the noblest testimonies ever uttered for the Reformation was the protest offered by the Christian princes of, the Germany, of Germany at the Diet of Spires in 1529. The courage, faith, and firmness of those men of God gained for succeeding ages liberty of thought and of conscience. Their protest gave to the Reformed Church the name of Protestant. Its principles are the very essence of Protestantism. You know, let me say this before we go any further. Uh, as I was studying this chapter over the past week, I began to realize that there were uh, some things in this story that are connected to the situation that we are facing right now in this movement. And uh, I saw some things, I, I, I connected them in my mind and in my notes. And then uh, last evening when my wife and I were watching the live stream and Brother Jeff's presentation, uh, afterwards I went back and was studying some more, going over, just re reviewing some things that I had uh, uh, saw and studied over the past few days, and I realized that they were a lot more connected than I realized. What I mean was, what you'll see this morning, hopefully, is that a, a lot of these things, Jeff spoke to these things last night in his presentation. I think it appears to me that God's providence is, is shown again. Anyway, um, so going to the, the uh, Question number two, actually the first question, what gave to the Reformed Church the name of Protestant? Their protest. Their protest. Okay. And uh, what she's writing there, you know, she's again quoting from De, uh, uh, Dobin's book. He actually says that in that in that book. Um, And uh, this is sort of a broad question. Question number three, what are the principles of Protestantism? You, if you read the, if you reread the chapter in Great Controversy, page, would you read it for us, brother? I started uh, realizing on 203, Point one is probably the best place to start in okay. terms of this question. What? We ratify this edict. We assert that when Almighty God calls a man to his knowledge, to his knowledge, this man nevertheless cannot receive the knowledge of God. There is no sure doctrine but such as is conformable to the word of God. The Lord forbids the teaching of any other doctrine. The Holy Scriptures ought to be explained by other and clearer texts. This holy book is in all things necessary for the Christian, easy of understanding, and calculated to scatter the darkness. We are resolved with the grace of God to maintain. Now here's where it starts describing uh, Protestantism. To maintain the pure and exclusive preaching of His only word such as it is contained in the biblical books of the Old and New Testament, without adding anything thereto that may be contrary to it. This word is the only truth. It is the sure rule of all doctrine and of all life, and can never fail or deceive us. He who builds on this foundation shall stand against all the powers of hell, while all the human vanities that are set up against it shall fall, 
before the face of God. Okay. I think it lists about three or four things in there that okay. nail down what Protestantism is. And hang on. Uh, would you read, would you like uh, skip the next two paragraphs and read the following one? Where it starts the principles? Yes. The principles contained in this celebrated protest constitute the very essence of Protestantism. So, a court, whenever, and she's quoting from de Bon, uh, Dolbin, uh, the French guy, when she's quoting from him, doesn't matter who was saying it, whether him or her, what is, according to this and what you've just read, and this is for anyone to answer, what are the principles of Protestantism? The Bible only is a, that's good, a good place way to, to start. It. Okay, that, that's, you could say that. Anybody else? The majority doesn't control anyone's conscience. Amen. How about the Holy Scriptures ought to be explained by other texts, other clearer texts? <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll talk more about that here in a moment. Uh, but... Let's now go to the next question. When did the protest of the princes take place? Give the exact date. What significance may that date have for our movement? Anyone was able to dig that one up? Of course, it's not in the chapter. You'd have to go somewhere else. Yeah, let me just... This is what I was... Now, this information may have already been dug up before. I know that uh, the, the, the young sister in Germany uh, did a study on at least the time of Luther. I never saw it in, in its entirety. But anyway, whether, whether it was dug up before or not, I don't know. But that protest fifteen twenty nine. It seems familiar, like maybe she did put that in the record. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you had a protest of the princes. It established uh, Protestantism. It established Protestantism. So what happens 315 years later? <coughs> oh, not, no, 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 no. Sorry. Got to... One track mine here. What happened on that? Prophetically. The first disappointment. First disappointment. Protestantism was surrendered. Protestantism was surrendered. Wikipedia doesn't agree with your first date. Is there a source that you use? You can't get much better than this one. Okay, that's that's your source. Yeah. Okay. This is several what? Probably a couple of hundred years old. Oh no, more than that. Well, an illustration of how you cannot depend upon Wikipedia. Thank you, brother. Uh, I have heard that Wikipedia uh, is, a, is a liberal... It's just open to change at anyone's whim. Yeah. What date do they give? Um, they actually say the protest was April 25th, 1529. 25th? Uh-huh. See, this guy, I'll tell you what. And if you can find it, because this is on the CD-ROM. If you can find it, he doesn't give just one date. I mean, he gives, that's the date of the protest, but I mean, he gives for a, a several events surrounding that event, he gives other dates. To, I, mean, I mean, he's detailed. So, yeah, but 315. 
<laughs> That's well, why we I've have you into, here. I've run into that number before, but I don't know what it means. Okay. So, okay, you have, notice now, brothers and sisters, we have not only the date is connecting to the Millerite movement at the very least, but the event itself, let's continue, we, we're going to get to it, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here, eventually, but I want to bring up something else before we get to that which is also significant with this. It's the whole thing together. So number five, question number five, what issue did this protest revolve around? What does this have to do with God's people at the end of the world? What, what will be the central issue for us? So it was religious liberty for them, freedom of conscience. It was written out, mind you, and I know this may not need to be mentioned. This is very obvious but I mean it was a an issue of the of the of the relation of church and state church and state like sister white we read it a while ago or will read it actually on page 69 of Acts of the Apostles where she says that a thus saith the Lord is not to be substituted for thus saith the state or thus saith the church okay this is what these men, these noble men, were standing for. They were standing against a union of church and state. Brother Toby. Um, the way it described it in the chapter on protest of the princes, the purpose, uh, the central issue was the the resolution that had granted freedom of conscience the central yes okay w was that it would be annulled at this at this yeah. protest thank you for bringing up uh, bringing that up because it's not that this is all important but just so you'll uh, have some bit of orientation about what was going on at the time um, in this chapter, where Dobin is telling this story, he brings up the fact, let me read to you the first couple of paragraphs in this. If the imperial party displayed such contempt, it was not without a cause. They felt that weakness was on the side of the, of the Reformation and strength with Charles and the Pope. But the weak have also their strength, and of this the evangelical princes were aware. As Ferdinand paid no attention to their complaints, they ought to pay none to his absence to appeal from the report of the Diet to the Word of God and from the Emperor Charles to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They resolved upon this step. A declaration was drawn up to that effect, and this was the famous protest that henceforth came or gave the name of Protestant to the reno renovated church. Uh, so what there was, there was this um, decree of uh, 1526. And uh, let me read further here. It says, the elector and his allies having returned to the common hall of the deity, this addressed the assembled, thus addressed the assembled states. Dear Lords, now, okay, so you have these, this is, this is this gathering of these princes and others, and they're going to address the, 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 the crisis that they are in. Because you'll see, if you would read this chapter, you, you would see that Ferdinand the king had given them religious liberty. He had agreed, it was, it was a decree that, granted them re religious liberty. But the papists didn't, of course, like that. So they tried to interfere and bring the king back to the point where he was before this decree. So this is why the princes are now gathering and they're essentially saying, look, you granted us religious liberty. Don't renege on your promise, essentially, in the most, most simple way I can put it. They were trying to bring him back to that original decree. And you'll, you'll, you would see this 
uh, it's called like uh, the, edict, the Edict of Spires. Uh, this celebrated act. Okay, they were trying to get the, the king back to his original position. So it says, uh, so they they're have this meeting and they say, uh, Dear lords, cousins, uncles, friends, having, having repaired to this diet of the, of the summons of his majesty and for the common good of the empire and of Christendom, we have heard and learnt that the decisions of the last diet concerning our holy Christian faith are to be repealed and that it is proposed to sub substitute for them certain restrictive and wondrous resolutions. Um, skipping here, we cannot therefore consent to its repeal. Um, and then you would see here several places where, sister, where you can tell it's the same that Sister White is quoting from. Okay? And... Uh, so further down it says, uh, for this reason we reject the yoke that is, universe, or that is imposed on us. And although it is universally known that in our states the holy sacrament of the body and blood of our Lord is becomingly administered, we cannot adhere to what the edict proposes against the sacramentarians, seeing that the imperial edict did not speak of them, that they have not been heard, and that we cannot resolve upon such important points before the next council. Moreover, so he has the word, more, they're saying moreover in, in this report, and then Dalbin interjects these words. He says, and this is the essential part of the protest. Then he continues with their, with their uh, uh, I call it a report, it's, it's, it's the protest of the princes, okay? They continue, as the new edict declares that the ministers shall preach the gospel, explaining it according to the writings accepted by the holy Christian church. We think that for this regulation, in other words, your promise, your granting us religious liberty, for this regulation to have any value we should first agree on what is meant by the true and holy church. So there's the issue of what? Before I say it. He's saying, he's, he's quoting them as saying that, uh, we could, that, that, that we can only preach the gospel according to the writings accepted by the holy Christian church. We think that for this regulation to have any value, we should first agree on what is meant by the true and holy church. Now, seeing that there is great diversity of opinion in this respect, that there is no sure doctrine but such as is conformable to the word of God, that the Lord forbids the teaching of any other doctrine, that each text of the Holy Scriptures ought to be explained by other and clearer texts, and that this holy book is in all things necessary for the Christian, easy of understanding, and calculated to scatter the darkness, we are resolved with the grace of God to maintain the pure and exclusive preaching of His, holy, of his, of his only word, such as is contained in the biblical... And then, Brother Toby read what I'm reading to you, this portion of it at least, just a few minutes ago. Okay? And so, what is the issue here? Okay, they're saying here that the leaders of the, the Catholic leaders of the church, Ferdinand, that you could only preach the gospel according to the, uh, uh, the writings of accepted by the Holy Christian Church. Well, that depends, essentially they're saying, well, that depends on what you mean by the church. So how are you going to find out what the church is? How are you going to, how, how are you going to establish that? Proof texting in the Word of God. Yes. Repeat. Proof texting in the Word of God. <coughs> so the issue is here, Methodology or method of Bible interpretation, like was mentioned last night. 
and it's over the issue. And it, now, so it goes on here. I don't want to take too much time. For these reasons, most dear lords, uncles, cousins, and friends, we earnestly entreat you to weigh carefully our grievances and our motives. If you do not yield to our request, we protest by these presents before God, our only creator, preserver, redeemer, and savior, and who will one day be our judge, <clears throat> as well as before all men and all creatures that we, for us and for our people, neither consent nor adhere and hit in any manner whatsoever to the proposed decree in anything that is contrary to God, to his holy word, to our right conscience, to the salvation of our souls, and to the last decree of Spires. So they keep referring to that last decree of Spires in, 16, in 1526. Uh, at the same time, we are in expectation that his imperial majesty will behave towards us like a Christian prince who loves God above all things, and we declare ourselves ready to pay unto him as well as unto you, gracious lords, all the affection and obedience that, that are our just and legitimate duty. And it, it ends right there. And then Dobin continues, and he says, Thus in presence of the Deity spoke out those courageous men whom Christendom will henceforth denominate the Protestants. They had barely finished when they had announced their intention of quitting Spires on the morrow. This protest and declaration produced a deep impression. The Deity was rudely interrupted and broken into two hostile parties, two groups of worshipers, thus prelude, preluding war. The majority became the prey of the liveliest fears. As for the Protestants, relying, this is hard, hur uh, humano upon the edict of spires and hur Davino upon the Bible, they were full of courage and firmness. I'm not going to take the time to write those down on the board. I'm just going to tell you what, what, what they're referring to is that one, the Hur, Hur Humano is human law, and the Hur uh, Davino is the divine law. So they relied upon Essentially, what, he's, what they're saying is they're relying upon man's law, which is the Edict of 1529, uh, gr granting them religious liberty. 1526. 1526, thank you. And, and upon the Word of God. Okay? The laws of God, the divine law. So in our day, in the crisis that we are about to face, what, are we, what would we be referring to or relying upon? the Constitution of the United States of America and the Bible. The Constitution, the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then it goes on a little bit further. It says, the principles contained in this celebrated protest of the 19th April 1529 constitute the very essence of Protestantism. Now, this protest opposes two abuses of man in matters of faith. The first is the intrusion of the civil magistrate, and the second, the arbitrary authority of the church. And then it goes on in, about that matter. They're addressing both of these abuses, the abuses of the state and the abuses of the church. Um, there's a lot more here. It's, it's, it's wonderful reading. I may refer to it here in, again in a moment. Yes? I know we're past April 19th, but from 1529 to 2019 is 490 years. 1529 to where? 2019. It's 490. Okay. Yes? It is correct. Um, Wikipedia does agree with April 19th being their first, almost the seed, and then April 20th they had a, a more developed 
And then on April 25th, they did their third. So they actually had three protests, just like Boston, Concord, Exeter, down at the end would line up with the three. And the third one was doubled because there was two notaries that signed it. So there's actually a really clear parallel between this and then what went on in 1844. And so it does agree with your April 19th date. Okay. And you could put an argument of methodology. Yes, that's what, that's what I meant to do, actually. Yes. Under them, but you could also extend your line out and go to the first day of the first month, which is 9-11. And uh, the, the action of the state was the Patriot Act against the Constitution, and the action of the church was spiritual formation. And then we're dealing with the whole thing all over again now in 2019 at the level of the priests. 490 years later. Mm -hmm. Amazing stuff. Yes. Even though some of us don't like the word methodology. You know what? <laughs> what? It's just the way, the, the, uh, to me, a better phrase, but it takes more time to say it, is methods of Bible interpretation. I'm almost positive that's, that's how she puts it. And adopted by Miller and his... Or that one, yeah. yeah. I think we should use that. <laughs> well, you got to remember, if we're correct about this argument, then the other side is, is producing a counterfeit, which means their great effort to say methodology, 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 is simply because they're counterfeiting the truth. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they would use the correct word to do yeah. so. But it's amazing to me that in both cases, here and here, and in our day, and 9-11, and all about methods of Bible interpretation. Yes. Now, let's bring up something else. Um, number six on your question sheet. In what way did God's providence hold in check the forces opposed the, that opposed the truth? Whom did God use? How, whom did God use to do this work? What lessons or parallels can we see in this for us? So, who, who did God use? Yes, Brother Toby. I don't want to answer all the questions, <laughs> but I like this one. Yes. Um, Why don't you read the paragraph? Oh, I can't. I just have it written here. I don't remember what paragraph it it's is. It's paragraph two of, of the chapter. Paragraph two of the chapter protest? Yes. Yes, okay. I knew it was somewhere real handy. Um, it's 197.2. Uh, 197.2. Yeah. It goes through and talks about... Do you want the whole paragraph or just the last part? No, go ahead and read the entire paragraph. Get, get okay. the whole thing A in context. A dark and threatening day had come for the Reformation. Not withstanding the edict of worms declaring Luther to be an outlaw and forbidding the teaching or belief of his doctrines, religious toleration had thus far prevailed in the empire. God's providence had held in check the forces that opposed the truth. Charles V was bent on crushing the Reformation, but often he raised his hand to strike. He had been forced to turn aside the blow. Again and again, the immediate destruction of all who dared to oppose themselves to Rome appeared inevitable. But at the critical moment, the army of the Turk, armies of the Turk, appeared on the eastern frontier, or the king of France, or even the pope himself, jealous of the increasing greatness of the emperor, made war upon him. And thus, amid the strife, uh, the tumult of nations, the Reformation had been left to strengthen and extend. Three enemies, so to speak, was what caused the, um, the tumult to cease in terms of the Reformation. Say again? Uh, it, it gave room for the Reformation to strengthen those three, th that threefold. No, those three things, yeah. Those three things. That's a threefold union yes, of is. a beast, the dragon, the dragon and, and a false, false prophet. prophet. That's the other thing I wanted to say. And God held him in check. Yeah. 
The Eastern Front is Islam. The King of France is um, the, dragon. the dragon, and the Pope is the beast. And Islam is a false prophet. Muhammad. Yes. So, so those three together. Yeah. So. Um, Number seven, question number seven, do a word search in the spirit of prophecy for the phrase strife and tumult of nations. What lessons can we gain from this in connection with its use in the great controversy, page 197? Anyone pursued that one? In the interest of time, the last page, 754 of volume five of the testimonies, last paragraph of the entire book, Brethren, it is no time now for mourning and despair, no time to yield to doubt and unbelief. Christ is not now, in a sa not now a Savior in Joseph's new tomb, closed with a great stone and sealed with a, with a Roman seal. We have a risen Savior. He is the King, the Lord of hosts. He sitteth between the cherubim, and amid the strife and tumult of nations, he guards his people still. He who ruleth in the heavens is our Savior. He measures every trial. He watches the furnace fire that must test every soul. And I think of the furnace that Brother Jeff mentioned last night, Daniel and, the, or rather, the, the three Hebrews, during, from now until July 18th. When the, stronghold, uh, when the strongholds of kings shall be overthrown, when the arrows of God's wrath shall strike through the hearts of his enemies, his people will be safe in his hand. You see you have there the furnace fire, the arrows of God's wrath, arrows, Islam, the strife and tumult of nations. You have them all in that one paragraph. Okay, then the other reference is uh, Prophets and Kings, page... Uh, 536. Prophets and Kings 536. As the wheel like complications, bottom paragraph of 536, as the wheel like complications were under the divine under the guidance of the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim, so the complicated play of human events is under divine control. Amidst the strife and tumults of nations, he that sitteth above the cherubim still guides the affairs of this earth. And I thought I had some more on that. Of course, you see Luke 21, 25. Don't just that... Oh, what you mean you're reading, what you're reading there, that paragraph, you need to remember what, what Stephen just put it in place a couple of days ago. This, this vision that he sees is given at midnight. Okay, so this vision applies to today, November 9th. The wheel-like complications, that's when, vision, when Ezekiel sees these. On, okay. On July 27th, 18... July 21st, 1844, midnight, midway between. Midway between. So this is speaking, this is as present truth as it can get. Amen. Amen. Um, all right. Um, we'll go, go to question number uh, eight. So let's go back to, we're we'll coming full circle here now. Back to Acts of the Apostles, page um, 69. So, this principle, the principle that the Princes or the uh, princes of spires uh, supported this principle. We in our day are firmly to maintain the liberty of conscience. 
the banner of truth and religious liberty held aloft by the founders of the gospel church and by God's witnesses during the centuries that have passed since then has in this last conflict been committed to our hands. There's the responsibility for this great gift rests with those whom God has blessed with the knowledge of his word. We are to receive this word as supreme authority. Now, breaking off from that paragraph for a moment, the question is, according to question number eight, uh, what are we to recognize human government as? So the paragraph continues, we are to recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment. And some people would capitalize on that and teach obedience to it as a sacred duty within its legitimate sphere. So we are to teach obedience to it as a sacred duty. But what are we to do when its claims conflict with the claims of God? Well, it says, we must... But when his claims conflict with the claims of God, we must obey God rather than men. Now, um, but when will, and I hope you understand, I hope we all here understand that this is connected to Romans 13. You know, we should know what Romans 13 is. What's Romans 13? This, well, we don't have enough time. Let's just, but Romans 13 it, it describes our duty to the state. Okay? But when will Romans, uh, let's read Romans 13 once so we get oriented here. I wasn't going to go to it and I decided not to, but I just decided I better go to it so you'll know what I'm talking about. Romans uh, 13 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that are that be are ordained of God. Thank you. So when will that be quoted as a reason why we should obey the civil power in spite of a clear thus saith the Lord to the contrary? When will Romans 13, 1 be quoted as a reason for us to obey the civil power in spite of a clear thus say the Lord to the contrary. Yes. So you have, there's several you can find on this. Uh, volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 712.3. There is a prospect before us of a continued struggle at the risk of imprisonment, loss of property, and even of life itself to defend the law of God, which is made void by the laws of men. In this situation, worldly policy, worldly policy, will urge 5T 712.3. In this situation, Worldly policy will urge an outward compliance with the laws of the land for the sake of peace and harmony. Have you ever heard such sentiments expressed? You know, just, you know, just do it. Just, just, just pretend like you agree with the law. Just do it anyway. Put aside your religion, okay, for the sake of peace and harmony. And there are some who will even urge such a course from Scripture, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, the powers that be are ordained of God. So you, here is one instance among others where you have a thus saith the Lord, let everyone be subject to the higher powers. And people will use a thus saith the Lord to conflict, to make God's word fight against itself. 
did not Satan use it, thus saith the Lord? In the wilderness of temptation, he used it, thus saith the Lord, didn't he? But it was twisted. It was, he left out part of the word. It was an entire, it was not a complete, thus saith the Lord. This so. Is, this impacts Sunday law issues. Yes. But Tess, Tess's approach is different because she's going to teach you that the Bible is a book of prejudice. That, that racism and slavery is upheld in the Bible and therefore you can't use the Bible. You have to protest against these things because the Bible isn't something that would be on the right side of those issues. So it's a little bit more convoluted from their, their point of view. If you can't use the Bible for any and every circumstance, then it's not inspired. It's just not. But when people speak that way, they show their ignorance of the Scriptures and of the power of God. Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for a thus saith the Lord. And we thank you that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the wilderness of temptation, said, It is written. We thank you for his example. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to follow his example, whom our fathers, the prophets, the patriarchs, the reformers, they all followed him and we want to follow in their footsteps as they followed him. And so Father we pray for your continued guidance for the rest of this uh, time. We pray that your Holy Spirit would, would continue to guide in everything that is said and done and thought of. We pray and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen.